Let's focus on here now. This is the AM squared, then that's also different than the S. Because the S was left out first. We are dealing with the group of 15, and we have picked one gamma M from this, multiply the equation, reduce the equation. And when N is running over, it's going to catch M once. We separated it out and wrote the remaining 14 as such remaining 14, that is, all of them are different than identity, and then the product of any two belongs to the same family, right? That's what we are going to check. Let's quickly inspect, although you have to do it on your own in principle, what are the things that we have? There is this, the identity in here, and the vector mu, gamma, mu, axial vector, mu, gamma, five, gamma, mu, and the sigma mu nu is, sigma mu nu is called, sorry, this is called the gamma mu a, let's use the book's notation, gamma mu, and the gamma mu nu tensor, sigma mu nu, we have, we remember that the space and time components are the alpha i and the ij components are the epsilon ijk sigma k, therefore there are the two sets. Now you have to sit down and check whether indeed the, the product of any two from this set belongs to the set. The idea is the following whether you pick arbitrary two and multiply them, whether it takes you out of the scope or you still stay in the same framework. Okay, that's the problem. <coughs> Let's do the following. If this was, there was a gamma zero and gamma one, the product of gamma zero and gamma one is alpha one, it is in here, for instance. If you take the alpha one and the gamma, the gamma zero, uh, vice versa again, or any one of them, it again falls into that group. If you want, enjoy yourself, I know it's boring, you make it, uh, you can construct a table. What is the table? You can uh, list five, gamma zero, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, and then gamma five times gamma zero, etc. If group 15 in here, this is all group theory if you want, and list the, the same in here. Write a multiplication table. It's not that difficult, right? It may take maximum half an hour. I, don't, I haven't seen any book doing it, but it's so, so stupid, perhaps that's the reason why they don't do it. Then multiply them. So to see that everything falls into the same. There is nothing, there is no product term in that which leaves you out of the framework, okay? So once that is understood, you can write this as, the product, let me see whether I have a special notation for this. For instance, call it a gamma, again, belonging to the same family. The product of any two is equal to gamma A. If it is belonging to this group, when you now take the trace, what do you have? The trace of these is zero, and, and that's proportional to what? The square of any of them is proportional to plus one or minus one, right? Or perhaps I need to check that. The product of any one, any, any two belongs to the same set, and the square of any of them is either plus identity or minus identity. Let's check that one too. Gamma zero squared is plus one, gamma one, gamma two, gamma two squared are minus one, alpha one squared is plus one, sigma i squared is plus one. And the only thing perhaps you need to check is this, gamma five times gamma mu. Again, you, see, you can check that it is the minus one. So the square of any of these 15 matrices are either plus identity or minus identity. So what do I get? Now if I take the trace once more, as these are traceless family, then there is only this term which gives you something, and you get the trace, you get plus or minus four times am is equal to zero. Thus, 
AM is equal to zero. Understood? M was chosen from here. S was already proven to be zero, AS. And any one of these 15 coefficients turned out to be zero. Let me summarize. What are the properties which we had to inspect and check? That any, the product of any two from this 15 gives you another one in the 15. And the, the square of any one of them are plus or minus identity. That's it. And they are traceless. These three properties I have used extensively. They are all traceless. This is out. I separate it out because that stays you know, as an odd man out. That's the identity anyway. Like the three sigmas and the identity. We are checking the, those <coughs> matrices corresponding to the three little sigmas in the, in the space. So we have 16 matrices which, are, which form linearly independent sets. The next we have to do the following. Okay. Once that is understood, let's consider the following family now. Bilinears. I take these 16 gammas, which have proven to be which are proven to be linearly independent, I sandwich them between psi bar and psi, and I would like to check the transformation properties of this 16 entity which I have constructed, and check how they transform under proper Lorentz transformations and the improper ones. Well, among the improper ones, we have considered <laughs> only the parity, right? I didn't have the time to consider the others, but at least we have the parity, space reflection. Let's start with the simplest. Gamma S, which is the identity. So what is the bilinear I would like to construct? Insert an identity between, so it's psi bar psi. How do they transform under proper Lorentz transformations and improper Lorentz transformations. Remember the, perhaps I should, psi goes to psi prime, which is psi of s, psi bar goes to psi bar prime, which is psi bar of S1. That was already introduced before. <laughs> I'm going to use these transformation properties in the spin or space. Look at the psi bar. Psi bar is quite clean, right? Psi dagger doesn't transform that elegantly, and psi bar does. So what do I have then? It goes to psi bar S inverse from the first factor and times S psi, which is psi bar psi. <coughs> this is an invariant. The thing is that it's the psi bar psi which is invariant. If I, for example, looked at the psi dagger psi, it wouldn't be invariant. Let's check immediately, just for the sake. <coughs> psi dagger psi, how about this one? So this goes to psi dagger times s dagger, and that is s is this equal to psi dagger psi? No. At least for the boost, they are not. For the rotations, yes, because we have demonstrated that e to the i over 2, theta sigma 3, that's unitary. Therefore, for the rotations, this is 1. But for the boosts, it's not, because s dagger is equal to s itself. So, psi dagger psi for rotations, psi dagger s square psi for boosts. 
You see why it is not the daggers that we are dealing with, it's the bars, side bars that we are dealing with. Because you have trouble in here, they are not invariant under boosts. So you cannot construct invariants. That's a side remark. This is true for the lambda, that's proper Lorentz transformations. And if I also include the parity in here, SP inverse S. So it's so clean that it is the same. So I can write it as both the, lamb the proper Lorentz and the parity is the same. Invariant. Let's check this pseudo-scalar if you want. Well, I will leave it to the later stage. The pseudo-scalar and axial vector, it's funny that people invented a strange notation. They call the partner of the scalar pseudo-scalar and partner of the vector, not the pseudo-vector, but axial vector. That's terminology. It all relate to gamma 5. If you are putting gamma 5 in the scalar and the vector, why do you use different terminology? You have to get used to that terminology. Now let's check what? Let's check the vector. You, you, sh you should enjoy this discussion. It's a beautiful discussion, really, because when you are constructing models, say in standard model and everything, these are the ty type of uh, properties that you have to use for, for constructing invariants. So what about this one? So I take this sidebar, gamma mu, sign. Let's put the, let's always use the, for these demonstrational effects, let's use the contravariance, not to get confused with covariance. How, do, how does this transform now under proper Lorentz and reflection? Okay, let's check. Psi bar gamma mu psi Lorentz. Psi bar S inverse of lambda. Gamma mu and S of psi. Right? This portion is the transform part of the psi bar. That portion is that. But now, let's focus on here. What is it? Lambda mu nu gamma nu. So it is lambda mu nu psi bar gamma nu psi. So what is this transformation property? It is the transformation property of four vector, right? So I, let me put a side remark, like x mu prime is equal to lambda mu nu x nu. Any entity which transforms like the four vector are called vector quantities. So this is a vector quantity. Actually, this is the vector, vector current, you know? In the, when you are constructing a model, this is a typical vector current. Do we need to check the parity? Well, in order to check the parity, we have to remember the transformation of the x mu under the parity. What is the transformation of x mu under the parity? x mu prime is equal to lambda p mu nu x nu. That's what we have to keep in our mind. Lambda p is not g mu nu, 1 minus 1, minus 1 and minus 1. So it is that type of transformation. So we have to demonstrate that this current if it is indeed, if it deserves the name to be called vector current, its zeroth component shouldn't change, its space part should change sign. That's what we call a current, right? A proper current. Can we check it immediately? Yes, we can. Let's put the P in here, psi bar in here, S inverse, gamma mu, but here now the, so the parity associated S. S I'll just write underneath what is it equal to, then I will lambda p mu nu indeed. So, 
So it is more or less a trivial statement. It indeed transforms like a proper four vector. Because in this second case, its zeroth component doesn't change and its spacebar changes like the four vector itself. So it is indeed a four vector current. Okay, good. What is the next thing I have to check? What was the order? Let me remember the order. Sigma mu nu, for instance. The tensor. So this was, the, the second was the, please correct this, I have, this is V. The third one is the tensor. I will use the contravariant for the safety of the notation. I don't want to raise and lower. Usually the <coughs> quantities are defined as the contravariant ones. So what is the associated bilinear? This is the associated bilinear. And under the transformation lambda, it goes to psi bar S inverse times sigma mu nu s psi. What is the s inverse sigma mu nu s? It is lambda mu rho, lambda nu sigma, sigma rho sigma. Do you need a demonstration for this? Well, the demonstration is easy. Let's do it in the side rather fast. If you remember this expression, I over 2, gamma mu, gamma nu, if you sandwich this between S inverse S, then you write it as gamma mu, gamma nu, minus gamma nu, gamma mu, then the, it becomes I over 2, S inverse gamma mu gamma nu S minus mu and nu are interchanged. Then you insert here an identity S and S inverse. And then use the, the, the well, okay, let me write it instead of talking about it. What is the first one? S inverse gamma mu S lambda mu nu gamma nu gamma rho rho let's use a different that's from the first and from the second lambda nu sigma gamma sigma i'm using the covariance property of s minus minus mu nu interchanged you just factor the mu and nu then you see it becomes mu rho lambda nu sigma, sigma mu nu. Recombine. It is inserting an identity between the two, the product of two gammas and finishing it. So what is the right hand side then? Right hand side is mu rho nu sigma psi bar sigma rho sigma psi. What is it? This transformation looks like the product of x mu, x nu, right? If you they are, take the product of two x's and transform, you just get that. So it's tensor, right? It transforms like the product of two super indexed x's. If they are mixed or lower indexed, you can repeat the same argument again. So it is indeed a tensor bilinear. Now we come to the subtle points, pseudo-scalar and the axial vector. By the way, if you repeat this for the parity, again, the only difference is that these are replaced by the parities, and same is valid for the axis. Say, so take the product of two four vectors, x mu and x nu, and try to transform it under the parity. You see that it's exactly the same. So that much is more or less trivial, but what is not that trivial is the pseudo-scalar and the axial vector. 
And they are really so important, particularly given the fact that parity is a very important point in the recontractions theory, particularly in the standard model. Okay, so this is fourth. Gamma axial is gamma five. So I consider this bilinear. I sandwich the gamma five between psi bar and psi. So let's go to proper Lorentz transformation. It goes to psi bar S inverse gamma five S psi. Now what is this S inverse gamma five S? We have worked out till now the S inverse individual gammas. Perhaps we can get it from there. We can get it from there. And there are, there are several ways of doing it, right? S inverse gamma 5 S. Is what? For this, I need the following theorems. What are the commutational relations of gamma 5 with the remaining gammas? Okay. So let me check the gamma mu first. What about gamma 5 and gamma mu? I haven't put the brackets yet. Sometimes you need to demonstrate commutators, sometimes you need to demonstrate anti-commutators. Therefore, I would like to discover the following. What happens when I jump gamma 5 over any component of gamma mu? Or for that matter, how about if you jump one of the gammas, 0, 1, 2, or 3, over the gamma 5? Let's do it that way. Okay, here is gamma 5, which is, the, the definition is, with the super indices, let me use the convention because it, it makes a difference in the sign. This is the definition, gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma 3. You see, this is by inspection again. It's so easy to do it by inspection. Let me take the gamma 0, for instance. Let's put the gamma 0 in here, try to jump over. It jumps over here, same, it's itself. One, two, and three. When it jumps over the three space, it changes sign. So gamma zero, gamma five, is minus gamma five, gamma zero, simply. Let's take, say, gamma one as a typical one. If I take gamma 1 and jump over gamma 5, gamma 1, once, minus, same, minus and minus. So any gamma mu, 0, 1, 2, and 3, when it jumps over gamma 5, it jumps over three of them which doesn't commute with itself. Because it's one of them in here. If one of them in here, there are three others left to change, which gives a sign change. So, so this is, let's put it for any i, because one was a typical one. It's one, one, two, or three. So what is the lesson I get from here? I get from here is the following, gamma five and gamma mu anti-commutes. Nice, isn't it? That's really all I need. Gamma 5 and gamma mu anti-commutes. Now what about that S? Oh, by the way, if it is gamma mu, what if I look at the following, sigma mu nu? Well, this is tentative. Perhaps I should erase this first. 
What is sigma mu nu? Now, gamma 5 jumps over gamma mu gives you minus sign. What about gamma 5 jumping over sigma mu nu? Sigma mu nu is the product of two gammas. Gamma mu, gamma nu, minus gamma nu, gamma mu. Gamma 5 jumps over the first gamma, gives you a minus sign. Jumps over the second gamma with the mu and nu index, plus. You see, that's the reason why I say sometimes you need commutators, sometimes you need anti-commutators. It anti-commutes with the gamma mu, it anti, it commutes with the sigma mu nu. Nice. Why this is relevant for my purpose? If you remember that for proper Lorentz transformation, S is sigma mu nu, lambda mu nu. Lambda mu nu are a collection of numbers coming from the Lorentz space. This is the sigma mu nu. What is the meaning of S? You expand this as 1 plus linear plus quadratic cubic. The first term is trivial because it commutes with anything because 1. The second term is sigma mu nu. When gamma 5 jumps over S, it jumps over sigma mu nu, which is commuting 0. So it commutes with everything. Sigma mu nu squared is 1. So then it follows from here that gamma 5 commutes with S. Because S contains either 1s or sigma mu nu's, okay? So it, if it commutes with the sigma mu nu, it commutes with S. If it commutes with S of this type of S, so what do I have? It's gamma 5. It commutes, jumps over. And S inverse times S is 1. So this is for the proper Lorentz transformation. This is the definition of proper Lorentz transformation. What about the improper ones? Parity. Well, parity is easy, easier than this really. SP was a constant B. Let's leave it as a constant times gamma zero. So if I now check S inverse, SP inverse now, gamma 5, SP, there's a B and B, B 1 over B, so it is gamma 0, gamma 5, gamma 0, right, this expression. Gamma 0 jumps over gamma 5, it's anti-commutes any component, it gives you minus gamma 0, gamma 5. Gamma 0 squared is 1, so it is minus gamma 5. How nice. So, summarize. Psi bar gamma 5 psi is, for the proper Lorentz, is equal to psi bar gamma 5 psi, and for the Lorentz, the parity, is equal to minus psi bar gamma 5 psi. That's why it is called pseudoscalar. It doesn't change under proper Lorentz transformations, but it changes sign under the parity. That's why pseudoscalar. Not always scalar. Under parity, it, it changes sign. Now let me turn my attention finally to the axial vector. Was it fifth? deal with contravariance all the time. So what is the quant bilinear that I am considering? Gamma 5, gamma mu, psi. 
Let's go under proper Lorentz transformation. Psi bar S inverse gamma 5 gamma mu S and psi. It looks quite complicated, isn't it? How do I work this out? I insert an identity in here. These are proper Lorentz transformations. I have demonstrated that for the proper Lorentz transformations, gamma 5 and S commute. This one is lambda, there's a sidebar, lambda mu nu gamma nu. So it is equal to lambda mu nu psi bar gamma 5 gamma nu psi. It indeed transforms like a four vector under proper Lorentz transformations. Now the parity. Psi bar gamma 5 gamma nu psi the parity. So it is psi bar S parity inverse Gamma 5, gamma mu, S parity, psi. Again, insert identities as always. SP, SP inverse. And let's check. Psi bar, SP inverse, gamma 5, SP times SP inverse, gamma nu sp psi. The crucial point is here. Gamma 5 and sp. sp is the gamma 0 times a constant, right? Therefore, this is gamma 0. Anti comes with gamma 5. Comes here with a minus sign. But this thing is lambda parity mu nu gamma nu that's yet mu so what is the result the result is minus this is a very important minus sign times lambda p mu nu psi bar gamma 5 gamma nu psi This portion is typical transformation under parity, right? Like the x mu itself. But there is an overall minus sign in the front. That's why it is an axial vector. Okay. Not a vector, but an axial vector. It's quite opposite to the vector itself. In principle, if it wasn't for this minus sign, this would be, space part would be changing sign. Time part is not, but with the, the minus sign here, it, space part is unchanged and it's the temporal part which is changed. So it is not a typical behavior of a vector. It is why we call it axial vector, or some people call it pseudo vector, okay? And these are important for the parity, invariance, etc. in the sophisticated models of standard model. So this is the end of that uh, portion, which are the so-called bilinear sets, covariants, and we know how do they transform. In the remaining last hour, I would like to discuss the construction of arbitrary spinors using the boost method. Let me motivate in the remaining five minutes, and after the break, we'll, we'll do the construction. Remember that 
Quite some time ago, about two weeks ago, perhaps we have constructed the spinors at rest. We have gone through a rather tedious way of identifying the commuting, mutually com compatible set of commuting operators and simultaneously solving the free, par uh, free particle at rest solution of the uh, Dirac particle. It turned out that there are four of them. Two of them are positive energy, e to the I minus i over h bar mc squared t times 1, 0, 0, 0, or 0, 1, 0, 0. This is the positive energy part, naturally associated with the upper portion. And notice that there we also use the sigma 3 to identify, to classify the solutions for the positive and negative energy. So for the positive energy, there is a spin up and spin down. For the negative energy, there is a spin up and spin down. For the particle at rest, particle at rest and spin up, spin down, of course, yes. Because spin is the quantum angular momentum operator at rest, because orbital part is gone. So what we are going to do next is, what is the explicit form of the spinor solutions for moving particles? We could approach in two ways. Either we can directly solve the Dirac equation, as I have done in the past, last year or so, as well. Uh, then we, what we should do is, we just write the uh, Dirac equation, look for the stationary solutions that is, have that typical time behavior, and then work out the normalization and everything, and we have a beautiful set of solutions directly following from the equation of motion. That is straightforward and very clean. There is also an ingenious, quite uh, smart way of constructing it in the following manner. Let me start motivating it, and I will finish it in the last hour of this semester. I hope I mentioned some of the properties as well. Okay, here are the two frames. Okay. And the K prime, which is moving. Well, suppose it is the, it is the frame of the moving object itself. I have a, a direct particle moving. If it is not under the influence of any external force, it's going to move with constant velocity. Therefore, its frame is an inertial frame. You have to really check whether a frame is inertial or not. You have seen what kind of difficulties we would be meeting if you overlook at the fact that a frame is not an inertial frame. Spin orbit, remember, the Thomas precession some time ago. So if the object is a free direct particle, there is no force acting on it. The force, if there is no force, the momentum or the velocity is a constant. Therefore, its frame, that is the frame in which it is at rest, is an inertial frame. And I call it K prime frame. So this is the rest frame. I identify it to be the rest frame. In this frame, the particle is at rest, right? So what are the possible solutions that I find in this frame? There are the following solutions. Psi prime rest r e to the minus i h bar m c squared t 1, 0, 0, 0, or the same exponential 0, 1, 0, 0. And there are e to the minus i over h bar minus mc squared t. I write it in this exotic fashion, 0, 0, 1, 0, or the same exponential, exponential times 0, 0, 0, and 1. These are the positive energies. Therefore, it is indeed mc squared. Because if it is at rest, the only energy is the mc squared. It is, I have written, this is the usual time factor, so it is the negative energy because you, I, I, I could have done it as e to the plus i over h bar mc squared t. I didn't want to write it that way. I wanted to make the minus 
uh, minus uh, negative energy to make itself manifest, the lower two components, one zero and zero one. So what we have to do now, what we can do, if these are the solutions in here, I know that the transformation between this rest and moving frame is done by lambda in the Lorentz space and by S of lambda in the spinor space. Or I can, if I start from with the rest frame, which is the moving frame, rest frame, rest frame of the moving object, if I would like to write the solution as observed by this laboratory frame observer, I have to do the following, right? Psi of x is equal to psi inverse lambda coming from the psi prime of x prime. Okay. So if I take these rest frame solutions and multiply it by the s inverse, then I get the moving spinor solutions. What was the full s originally? lambda e to the minus i over 4 omega general s. But what I have to do is look at the boost because it is moving, however the particle is at rest, so my frame is moving in the opposite direction. K is moving in the minus v direction, correct? So I have to write this transformation here, just a boost operator taking into account the fact that it is moving in the minus v direction. So we'll go back and check our notes, what was the s for the boost, and I take the inverse, I can use the following theorem, remember? S inverse of lambda, which is also equal to the S of lambda inverse, right? We have demonstrated that. And we are, I'm going to use that theorem. And that's after the break. So it shouldn't take us, it shouldn't take us more than 10 minutes, as a matter of fact, because this preparation was important. The rest will be a trivial thing.